Dear listeners, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Before we begin today's program, I would like to request that you consider making a donation towards this project. I started this podcast when I concluded that in this fast moving world in which we reside, most of the time we, myself included, have sought to compromise depth for sound bites and half thought through ideas. This podcast is dedicated to do something different, to engage with those in our communities that have something worthwhile saying and give them time to say it. If you, like me, would like this podcast to be more regular, even weekly, I would appreciate it if you click on the donation link in the show notes so that we can take this project to the next level. Jazakallah khair. It's interesting because like I was speaking to friends of mine earlier and they were saying that progressively in podcast I'm sounding more and more frustrated in Muslim <laughs> podcasts. Yes. The Ottoman Caliphate was a leading power of its time. Yet as my guest today Dr. Yakub Ahmed argued on a previous show, the Muslim Ummah is in a current state of collective amnesia about what this polity represented and indeed how it functioned. I have to profess, before speaking to Dr. Yakub, I had developed a host of assumptions about the Ottomans that had little bearing with historical facts. Those that do study the Ottomans sometimes rely exclusively on dubious Western historical sources, some of which deliberately echo a political narrative that justified European colonialism and the current nation-state project that blights the Muslim world. In this show, I talk to Dr. Yakub about the relationship between the ulama and this empire. Were they mere political apparatchiks steeped in the power and patronage of powerful sultans? Dr. Yakub paints a vivid picture of the role the ulama played in the 600 years of Ottoman rule, their responsibilities, and contrary to common opinion, he questions the assumption that they were mere instruments of autocratic rulers. Dr. Yakub is one of the world's leading Ottoman historians. He is currently teaching Islamic history at Istanbul University. We decided to split the interview into two. The first part will look at the ulama uh, in the early period of the Ottomans, and the second part will look at controversies of the ulama in the 18th and 19th century, such as the printing press and uh, the banning of coffee. Uh, that, inshallah, will be next week. Dr. Yakub, it's great to speak to you again. Um, I um, last spoke to you at a restaurant in um, the center of Istanbul, and uh, we had a quick discussion about uh, where I live here in Bashakshir, which is uh, the, I suppose, part of Greater Istanbul. Um, and you, you raise a fascinating point about uh, the Muslim migration. It'd be, it'd be great to get your, uh, for our listeners really, to get your uh, your views about uh, why so many Arabs have moved to Istanbul, but in particular to this part of Istanbul? Um, well, it was created um, as an alternative Muslim space. I don't think it was designed for the sort of large Arab migration that's taken place there, but um, it, it became fortuitous for those who had built um, apartments there that they finally I mean it was always going to be difficult to get such a large um, sort of wave of Turkish Muslims to come to to that part of town I mean one of the appeal of Istanbul is Istanbul itself right so um, but having said that the, the idea was I guess was um, to be in close proximity to Istanbul so that people can can get in and out of the city and there was a concern that the city itself was I mean, this is not new. This is like, there's always been a concern that Istanbul as a city is a city which can um, can um, sort of like encourage people to go down a path which is un-Islamic. Um, that's, that's even existed in the Hamidian period. I mean, in, when the Arab kids were being brought from the Ashirid Maktabisi to Istanbul from, from the Arab provinces, they put them in a special boarding school and they wouldn't let them go out alone at night. They had a chaperone because they were concerned of the sort of activities that took place in the city. So it's a monster of a city in that sense. But the way it's panned out, I mean, a lot of not it's not migrants, actually, that, that have uh, what I mean by migrants. It's not refugees in that sense who have turned up in, in, in 
Bashar Chihir. It's actually affluent Arabs too, um, who want a more, um, and they want the insular life. They're, they're content with that, I guess, because, you know, um, they can be detached from the hustle and bustle and they don't want to get involved in the politics or anything of that nature. And all the shops are there, all the foods, there. Well, what, you don't need to go anywhere. You know what I mean? Actually, I've always wondered, why is it? Maybe maybe it was the case and it was reversed after the, the secular reforms. But, uh, of course, the Ottoman Empire, Istanbul was the centre of the Ottoman Empire, Ottoman Caliphate. Why is it that uh, you didn't see this level of migration from the Arab countries to the centre? Or did you? I mean, have I missed something? Um, there, there was migration of that nature, but in reality, um, in those days, um, migrations happened for different types of reasons. Um, so we had, I mean, Cairo, for example, was a humongous centre in, in, in the Ottoman world. And a lot of Arabs would have uh, preferred, I mean, I give an example. During the um, the opposition movement that emerged against Sultan Abdul Hamid II, a lot of ulama from Istanbul went to Cairo. Cairo was like a center in that sense, but the Ottoman world had multiple centers. So I, I think, you know, sometimes, I mean, when we think of Turkey, then of course Istanbul, the way that we visualize it, Istanbul is like this uber center. But if we look at the Ottoman domains more, um, you know, spread it out a little bit, then we start to see multiple centers. Baghdad, for example, was another center. Um, and you know, what's interesting is a lot of Muslims who would come from India on the Hajj, for example, they would um, then not go back and they would stay in Makkah and Medina. And then the Ottomans tried to usher them along. So then they, they, they would bleed into um, Baghdad and some of them came to Istanbul and so forth. So there was Arab movement here. You're right, it wouldn't have been that large, but that's just because the, the headache of moving in large numbers why would anyone do that and the only time people move in large numbers in that case is usually war it's usually some sort of like i mean for trade and so forth i mean the numbers are not like that the large. that's why you do have streets here like um Badad Jaddasi, which is where usually um arabs would have come but arabs you know it's interesting when you read the accounts arabs are often found istanbul these were the elite Arabs. They enjoyed visiting Istanbul, but the idea of living in Istanbul was something that they they didn't enjoy. They preferred living in the Arab provinces. And maybe this could be like um, an idea of internalizing what it means to belong to home. Um, it, it could be that. And language, I think language would have been an issue. We see this in the case of uh, Khairuddin al-Tunisi, who's from Tunisia, becomes a Grand Vizier under Abdul Hamid, and he can't speak Ottoman Turkish properly. And, you know, they, he's mocked in Istanbul for his, you know, kind of like um, poor Turkish, but um, exceptional Arabic. And language, even now, I think if you see with many foreigners, including Arabs, who come to Istanbul, language is a huge issue. I mean, maybe we'll explore. I mean, I, I, in a way, my questions today are, are very broad and, and they sort of span the entire breadth of the Ottoman state. And so my apologies. Again, I, I suspect it's it's down to uh, my my lack of specific understanding of Ottoman history. I mean, I've, I, I think I, I, maybe it's the case for most of us in, in you know, from Western uh, countries and maybe around the Muslim world, we, we tend to see the Ottoman in a very monolithic, very sort of one size fits all way. I mean, like when I saw the questions in themselves, it, it's interesting because like I was speaking to friends of mine earlier and they were saying that progressively in podcasts, I'm sounding more and more frustrated in Muslim <laughs> podcasts. And I don't realize that. And they say, and, and the reason being is because the line of questioning is quite consistent in terms of what Muslims want to know about the Ottomans. And this is why I had made that argument about the collective amnesia, because what's interesting is um, I feel like in Turkey, when students are taught Ottoman history, and the Turks do this exceptionally well, by the way, is they really do paint a picture of, from Orhan, Osman Ghazi all the way to the end. So you start to, Turks can sort of like, Turkish students can sort of, those who study Ottoman studies anyway, and Islamic studies, they can sort of grasp, okay, what type of world this was. Yeah. Um, the change in the conflicts, the, the, the the fluctuations, the evolutions, the transformations, they can grasp it. And Muslims, they, they forget sometimes that this is a 600 year empire, yes. you know, and it's not static. It's, it's like trying to compare Victorian Britain to Britain today. And the gap would be the same, imagine 600 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, or, you know, comparing the Americans from 
I don't know, from, from the 16th century onwards. It's, 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 it's vast. And so a lot of times when Muslims make impressions of the Ottomans, it's, it's come from sources which they try to ac access more and more now, but it's coming from sources which are absent from the Muslim tradition. And so that's difficult for them. So then they're dependent on, 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 on their own endeavor of picking up books here and there, and, and hopefully they can uh, fashion an image. And we've said this before, the history is political and history is ideological. Now, Muslims don't see it like that. So this is part of the problem. I, I mean, I know we, we're uh, here to talk about uh, the ulama in, uh, uh, in Ottoman history and, and the role of the ulama, but uh, what, what you mentioned, Vam, is very fascinating that, you know, there's a 600 year history and, and we tend to know at best, you know, the, the highlights, but can you paint a picture, a very brief picture of the 600 years? Like, how would you describe the 600 years of Ottoman history? You know, before I paint the picture, I'll tell you something interesting. So um, I, I was given a workshop on Monday last week explaining to the students about why Muslims should study history. And I said to them, history is about the past. And they said, yeah, of course it is. And I, when I asked them to explain, they were able to explain it. And then I said, history is about the present. Explain it to me. And they were like a little bit confused. And then some of them broke it down and the, they started to realize that much of history writing is about what, how we resonate with the present and then superimpose it on the past. We try all we try to, to try to um, make sense of the past through the prism of the now in that sense. And I, the reason why I'm explaining this is because a few years ago, um, Sultan Abdul Hamid II was probably, if you ask the Turk, name me your favorite Sultan, they would have said Abdul Hamid II. In the last year, that's changed. Ask them now and they'll say Fatih. And why, why is Fatih? Probably because of what's happening in the political environment in Turkey at the moment. Also because of the turning of Hagia Sophia back into a, a mosque. Um, the conquest of Istanbul as a narrative is becoming more and more prevalent within various sections of the political spectrum in Turkey. And so you see, saw a shift in, in that sense. So um, that's one of the things that I, I think it's important before I go on to your question. So um, look, we, we one of the concerns we have is that Ottoman studies is sultanic centered. It's centered around the, 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 the person of the sultan. Or when we speak of the ulama, which we'll do today, it's like when people say Ottoman ulama, I always ask them the first question, what do you mean by that? Who are the Ottoman ulama? Um, um, so it's, and we'll go into this in detail, but it starts off as a post-Mongol entity. And I think for people to understand the early entities like Orhan Ghazi, Osman Ghazi, Artur as well, and the early Ottoman principality, you have to understand the Mongol invasion. You have to understand the devastation of the Mongol invasion, but not only that, there's an assumption that the Mongols were like, you know, um, you know, uh, they were like the Dothraki in Game of Thrones, you know, they just came and destroyed. But the Mongols brought with them particular traditions and cultures too. They brought a political culture along with them and they brought particular forms of legal practices. <clears throat> and so for the Ottomans in that early period, um, coming out of that Mongol world, post-Mongol world, that they had to still fashion their statecraft within a within a specific form of what you would call Mongol violence. And this is when we see the case of Bayezid in particular, when he's state building, he goes to war with Timur Um, And that's very strong in the minds of many of the early Ottomans. And so when we get to fight his conquest, that's clearly a turning point. The turning point is one of two. One is the um, expeditions into the Balkans. So the interaction with, with, with the Christian world in that sense. And then the conquest of Istanbul, which is a definitely a turning point in the sense that Muslim, forget Ottoman history, Islamic history, if we look at it as a whole, has never um, achieved a monumental feat of defeating the center of Christendom in the way that the Ottomans did. I mean, the, okay, the conquest of, of Quds and so forth is very different in terms of politics. And this changes everything. This changes the way Muslims view themselves. It turns them into a, a, a specific imperial power. And that let that that type of imperial power, I don't think even the Abbasids didn't uh, fashion in that sense. It's, it's a different world. And people ask, why did they become an imperial power in that nature? Because the local population would never have accepted them if they hadn't. Um, they conquered Istanbul. For, and the majority of the Ottoman domains under their influence was non-Muslim. Uh, 
It wasn't Muslim, by the way. These people forget that. These are Muslims ruling over a predominantly non-Muslim population. And the non-Muslim population is, to some degree, submitting to Islam in that sense. And then, obviously, you get the period of, of, of Selim once he goes down into the Arab provinces. And that totally changes everything. Because now you have a actually a domain which is... Um, is 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 a caliphate. It claims to be a caliphate in that sense. Um, it's part of the Arab world. Um, there is now interaction, more fluid interaction between Arabs and and Ottoman thinkers, technocrats, and so forth. And that you, they start to imagine the culture within, from Fatih to Selim. The, the imagination of being an imperial dynasty is already taking place, and a powerful imperial dynasty of that. And then you start to see um, the contestations of trying to consolidate authority, trying to consolidate power. I mean, um, we then see a shift probably in Genj Osman's period, which is, um, when is Genj Osman? In the 16th, 17th century, uh, early 17th century, um, where um, we see the first act of regicide. And this is a shift away from fratricide. And now people... We'll, we can talk about it later, but fratricide actually it comes out of the Mongol tradition, actually. The idea of safeguarding the interests of the state. And the reason why it's done, and it's not done, you know, the minute a child is born, they kill them or something like that. Usually it was done with the fear that there's going to be a contestation over power. Most of the times that happened. Um, it's just later on people started to make it, using that as a, as a um, sort of like a, a tool to say the possibility of rebellion could happen and, and they, they abused it in some shape or form. Um, but that um, regicide, it was real and it meant that the Ottoman um, institution or the, pa the palace itself was under threat, threat under, from the Janissaries in particular. And the possibility of an internal institution created by the Janiss by the Ottomans who could wipe them out is becomes a real fear for everyone. In that sense, you can see why the dynasty then tries to find ways of legitimizing its hereditary rule because of the fear of it being totally taken out. And now we see a different Ottoman Empire. We see an Ottoman Empire in which the military class, which they had established, has become a powerful check on sultanic authority. And it's in, in Istanbul, and that's a different role. And then obviously the 18th, 19th century, we start to see the impact of the colonial powers and then the shifting towards I would say the 19th century is seismic mainly because of a new technology. And a new technology means that they, they and, and the bureaucratization of the state. So we, we have the abolishment of the Janissaries. And I think that changes everything. Um, we have now a, a, a center which is um, held to account far more by legal um, language than by physical force to some degree. But we, we once again see an, another revolution in, in, in the Young Turk period um, by the military junta, and then that changes everything as well. So, um, but we, we continue to have shifting borders. People forget that. I mean, for example, um, parts of the Balkans is lost um, in the 19th century, but then Sudan becomes part of the Ottoman Empire in the 19th century. Uh, Yemen was always on and off. So then what we learn is that these areas and provinces, um, uh, how do they adhere to Istanbul as a center or to the caliph? It's via negotiation. There can be no force. You can't force people to adhere to you because you say you're the caliph. You, then you're not a caliph, you're a dictator. So there has to be a continued negotiation with the various provinces and, and, and strongmen in the various parts of the Ottoman domains. But negotiation is, is, is never static. People can reject it. They can say, we don't want to be a part of your domains anymore. We're not happy with your domains. And so in that sense, different provinces have different ways of negotiating with the center. And so this is where you get a complexity of, of what does a caliphate look like that is multi-ethnic across three continents um, with different forms and different terrains and different styles of cultures regarding politics. How does that work? And that's the complexity here, you know. And the Ottomans are continuously negotiating. And this is why then later the verses in the Quran about obey Allah, obey the messenger, and obey those in authority. What does that mean here? Is it absolute obedience or not? Um, does obedience mean just whatever he says you, you do? And we can see that in the Ottoman case it's a little bit different because many Ottoman sultans are deposed. So this that asks another question we'll go later about the 19th century, which is how do you remove a, a caliph from power? 
Islamic history has always shown that you have to actually kill him or something. So it's it's 19th century, they move away from that culture. They say, okay, we can... And there are debates about, can we put in terms, you know, um, who would come after and, and things like that. So um, it's 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 a... You know, it's it's a nomadic principality that starts off in a little area in Anatolia, and then it, it it makes its way to the Balkans, and it's a Balkan project actually. The Ottomans is mainly a Balkan project, and it brings Islam to Europe, and then Istanbul becomes part of its center, making it an imperial center, and then the Arab provinces become a part of it, and then you know, gaining legit- legitimacy from the Arabs is not easy for them. And then uh, after that, there's a period of consolidation because there's only so much expansion you can do. You have to consolidate what you have. That's where people start to push in, Muslims in particular, decline narrative. Because for them, they they want to see continual expansion. But how do you consolidate authority? How do you consolidate Islam? How do you create mechanisms for Islam to be, um, you know, um, to manifest in society? And then after that, you you then start to see the, the colonial expansion and the modernization and and, and so forth, and then collapse. So, you know, and that's World War One is a heavy collapse on them. Well, that's great. I mean, I think you've, you've uh, sketched a really, uh, really broad and, and fascinating picture of the Ottomans during this 600 year period. And I can now visualize, okay, what's, uh, what's happening politically in the Ottoman state as these different phases are, are developing. And, and today, of course, we're looking at uh, the role of the ulama in, 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 this, uh, in this period and, and how the ulama interact with the Ottoman state. Well, let's start from the very beginning. Um, in fact, you, you said in your, in your um, um, summary of the, of, the, of the period that um, the Ottomans, uh, they were a caliphate and they saw themselves as a caliphate. At what point did the Ottomans declare themselves as the, the caliphate, the title given to uh, the uh, those Muslims who would follow uh, the Prophet وسلم, and, and the legitimate uh, rulership of the Muslim world. So historians have a difference of opinion. It comes down to how they're looking at the sources, actually. I mean, for, for many historians, they're making the argument that the Ottomans probably didn't see themselves as a caliphate until very later on, because you start to see that documentation in 1774 in Kuchuk when the Ottomans lose to Crimea and they write in the document that they are the caliphs of the Muslims all over the world. Is that the first time they, they, that reference to the caliphate is mentioned in an official document? In an official diplomatic document really? with a foreign power. Yes. Um, but you can see clearly in the case of Genj Osman before that um, in, in the 17th century that he considered himself a caliph. Hmm. So um, maybe they were not exercising the word to be a caliph in that sense, but it's clear that they have internalized it already. And right. I would argue, this is my personal opinion, um, that I think Selim was well aware of his um, calls to be in a caliph because when Bayezid, prior to him, his father, Bayezid actually um, makes a sense of petition to the caliph in, in, in Egypt at the time, asking if he can be called uh, the Sultan of Rum. So he's well aware of these honorary titles of, of that provide forms of legitimacy and power. I think Selim's expedition to the Arab world, um, while some people argue that it, his intention was to just defeat the Mamluks in the, in the sort of like contested areas between the Ottomans and the Mamluks, and then when he saw an opportunity, he kept pushing forward until he came to Cairo. I think for me, I'm not too sure. I, I think that the, the types of the, the number of people he got together for his expedition, that type of um, what you can say organization, seems like he was well aware that he was going to go all the way down south. Um, he he had it was a, it was well prepared, and he, there was a frustration in him in regards to the Mamluks in particular. And I guess there is a frustration in him in. And you see this with Bayezid earlier, where him and his brother, Jem, when they're contesting for power, and Jem goes to Egypt and speaks to uh, the, the caliph as a way of delegitimizing Istanbul. That there is probably, a, and Selim is, a, a, you know, um, is, is privy to this type of um, word of mouth information, that probably there is an agitation that, the, that Egypt can delegitimize them. So he's gone down south and... He's, 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 he's defeated the Mamluks comprehensively. Now, imagine being in charge of 
Anatolia, the Balkans, and the Arab provinces, the idea that then you can have a caliph in Cairo who can oversee your authority in that way when you're the real ruler in charge, <clears throat> that wouldn't have made sense in that, in that world of you. So I'm sure, um, I mean, the argument is, is that caliph himself then passes over the, the, the baton to, to sell him, but I'm sure that this is probably done under duress. He's just said, you know, okay, I'm out. Um, now, there's a lot of information making the case of a strong man. Um, taking authority and so forth. And as you see this throughout the Abbasid period, their fear of the Seljuks and so forth, of the possibility of them being a weak state and the Seljuks practically thinking, you know, um, how is this feasible? But it's because of the language of Nizam al-Mulk in particular, and then uh, the likes of Ghazali and Joani who, who make the argument that it's better to have a reciprocal relationship with the Abbasids and not to be seen as people who took out the Abbasids. But I think, uh, and Selim probably would have been aware of that too after the Mongol invasion. He didn't want to be seen as being one of them, like the Mongols in, in any shape or form. But the, the speed in which um, society just accepted it. So the, the, the narratives talk about when he goes into Damascus, there's no, the society is just like, yeah, fine. When he comes into Aqsa and Quds, people are like submitted to it. And that's probably because there is a sentiment also that the Mamluks will be in a lot more harsher um, to local society, and that Salim was, at least in rhetoric, offering something different. Um, and so I, I'm assuming it, Salim was aware that he was caliph, or that he he, um, he probably was aware of his designs to be caliph. And Suleiman definitely uses it. Um, but then, you know, the idea is that they're using multiple titles, fine, but um, because we see this in the works of Hussein Yilmaz, is he makes the argument that once Selim comes to Istanbul, the ulama in particular are now writing long tracts about what it means to be a caliph. And why are they doing that? The problem being is because they are fashioning a particular culture and they're fashioning a specific Ottoman culture of the caliphate, which is that they're, they're insisting on, on, on the piety of the Sultan as, as one of the conditions and the morality of the Sultan as one of the conditions and him being upright and administering justice. And this sort of culture that um, it's probably taken from works of the ulama before, but then given it a, a specific um, sort of like Ottoman flavor to it, um, which is different than, than the works that have been written before, which are far more technocratic in the way that they're written in terms of what are the conditions of a Khalifa. What are, but here they, they're talking about the person of the Sultan and, and his character and characteristics. And this, this, these works became popular in Istanbul suggesting that even in Istanbul, there needed to be an, um, an attempt to generate a particular form of public opinion so that people could understand what it meant now to be the caliphate. Because probably even though for a long while, people might have spoken about the caliphate, but the idea that you've become the caliphate, you know, what does that mean in practical sense? And so they're now telling people and they're teaching people and educating them. And also, um, you know, they're probably trying to uh, attain the legitimacy from the Arab provinces that, okay, look, um, we're not dictators or anything. You had a caliph before, wasn't doing the job. We're a proper caliphate now. This is how it's going to roll. And um, I wouldn't be surprised if that happened. I mean, the, the, the documentation on that is sketchy for sure. And I'm painting a particular picture. I'm not denying that. But from my interaction with that period of Selim, um, I, I'm willing to go with that. If, if we're saying this is the 16th century, the Ottomans, they rout the, they defeat the Mamluks, and, and now uh, you're seeing in the text of the ulama uh, discussions, explicit discussions intellectually, but also em emotional discussions about the role of the caliphate and, and uh, Selim as the as caliph. What was in existence before then? So in 1258, Baghdad uh, is sacked. The Mongols destroy the capital of the uh, of the Abbasid uh, Caliphate, and and the Muslim world is is in turmoil. Uh, who made who laid claims to the Caliphate uh, in that intervening period? You know, you've you've looked at the Ottoman ulama in particular, and and what they were saying. How did the Ottoman ulama respond to that? Those years where there didn't seem to be a discernible caliphate uh, for, for many a century. What's, what's going on there? Yeah, I mean, you know, what's interesting It's not only that. I mean, I was explaining to some of my students in regards to the Crusades. So you look at look, 1071, you know, 
Manzikart. 1091, uh, Alp Aslan loses against the Crusades, right? By, by, and by 1092, I think, Jerusalem is in the hands of the Crusades. And it's only 80 years later that Salah deliberates um, um, uh, Aqsa in that sense, in Jerusalem in particular. So it, there's, a, there's a continued flux and backwards and forwards if you look at it long spans of time in that sense. And then the Mongol invasion comes along. Yes. Um, and then there's another wave of a, a particular form of violence. But although the Mongols are very different from the Crusaders in terms of they don't have this religious zeal um, they're not driven by religion in that way. So they, they are a lot more pragmatic in regards to their culture. Um, but the Muslim world seems to um, want to adhere to maintaining um, the Arab world, shall I say, the, 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 the Eastern um, M- Muslim world in particular, wants to maintain the adherence to um, particular institutions like the Caliphate that have become part and parcel of Arab Muslim identity in that sense. So in Istanbul's case, you can see it's coming from a, I mean, not Istanbul, sorry, but the early Ottomans anyway, they're coming from a post-Mongol world. Um, So their sort of imagination in the way that they they structured this state would have been in response to Mongol realities and Mongol violence. Hence, they would have to have been particularly um, violent themselves as a way of surviving. And I'm not using the word violence here in a negative context. I'm just trying to explain that the world is, is a messy place right now. This is why we're seeing in Arthur Ghazi constant fighting that's taking place. And this is the, the world they inherited. And to survive in that, that was the constant. There's a constant threat from external factors and a constant threat to survive. So they would have imagined the world probably in the post-Mongol realities. What's interesting is they're interacting with four, three, possibly four legacies. The earlier legacy is the Seljuk Turkic leg- legacy, which... To what degree did the Seljuks have a particular influence on Ottoman imaginations? I mean, we do know that in, in regards to Seljuk history, the Seljuks have an imagination of the Caliphate. They have a reality of the Caliphate. They interact with it. They become protectors of the Caliphate and sort of like um, proponents of Sunni Islam in the region, actually. To what degree that bleeds into Ottoman imaginations or Turkic principality imaginations, I'm not sure, but I'm willing to guess that it's there. Um, now the Ottomans are dealing with, as I said, a post-Mongol world, but they're also now just dealing with Christendom. Uh, so they interact with these multiple realities, uh, where the majority of the subjects of their states, their principalities, are probably not Muslim. And then they're dealing with the Mamluks, and the Mamluks, unlike the Mongols, are maintaining the notion of the Caliphate. It's the Mamluks who require the imagination of the Caliphate. It's the Mamluks who, in fairness to them, continue the idea of having a caliph in, in Cairo. And the Ottomans are not um, detached from Mamluki realities. So when we're talking about the ulama, um, I wouldn't say that we have an Ottoman ulama here in the institutionalized sense, in the early period. But clearly, we have to ask ourselves, and this is maybe questions that researchers might want to ask themselves, is to what degree were the ulama aware of Mamluki realities? My hunch would be they, would, they possibly were aware Because if we are to suggest that the ulama are aware of, in their tradition, they are attached to learning of books and works and ideas of scholars of the past, they would have had a a particular access to both Seljuki and Mamluki um, works in that sense. And they would have been aware of these ideas, at least, in principle. Whether they had an imagination in the earlier period that they could fashion themselves into a caliphate, I'm not too sure. I don't think that was part of the imagination. The imagination just would have been survival of the fittest. But it's clear that the ulama would have been reading multiple works. And the fact that, as I said, from Orhan Ghazi, quickly to you get to, to, to Murat and Bayezid, you see that there is a recognition that the caliph in Mamluki Cairo has the capacity to give legitimacy to them. That awareness is an indication that they're aware of the importance of these, an institution which is known as the Caliphate as having legitimacy in the eyes of Muslims. Does that matter to them? Probably it does matter to them. Um, to what extent they had internalized it themselves, we don't know. But by the time they become a Caliphate, what, what is the repository they're, they're drawing from? It's not from them. So they're drawing from something that's come prior to them. And this has to have happened from the ulama. The ulama must have um, drawn these ideas from 
the entities that came before them and works before them. And what's interesting is we do continuously see influences of Al-Ghazali in particular throughout Ottoman history. Um, so um, it wouldn't surprise me if, you know, like Selim is alive when Fatih is alive, near the, near the end of Fatih's reign. And Fatih is interesting because he doesn't only conquer Ista uh, Constantinople to turn into Istanbul. Fatih blitzes Anatolia and unifies Anatolia and uh, amongst the Turkish principalities. And Fatih has ambitions of, of Italy and Rome. So Fatih clearly has this expansionist um, mindset to what it, it would be worth asking. I don't think it's a strange question to ask whether Fatih did have intentions of going down south and whether this idea of going down south um, was within the corridors of certain thinkers in the Ottoman domains of which Selim picks up on or does Selim pick it up simply because the Mamluks are an immediate threat. I don't know. Um, but um, the minute they become a caliphate, um, they're aware of it. So it's difficult to know. It's the honest answer to your question. But I would be surprised that they didn't have some, the ulama in particular, were not aware of the works that were floating around. Okay, so the 16th century seems to be um, a, a milestone in Ottoman history. They, they managed to... Um, defeat the Mamluks, they've, they've now um, uh, got, uh, for the first time, they've got um, largely Muslim subjects uh, who belonged formerly to the Mamluk Caliphate, and, uh, and, and they're, now, uh, they're, they're now a traditional Islamic government, uh, they're responsible for large numbers of, of Muslims uh, across Arabia. Um, what is the relate so so and this is the point at which um, the caliphate discussion becomes the most apparent discussion because of course now you've got you know a state that is a, that is um, ruling great great swathes of Muslim uh, land. Uh, let's talk about the Ilmiya system uh, that is established around this period. By the way, is the Ilmiya system is it established in response to? Sorry, my chronology is terrible. Is it in response to? Uh, the the conquest of the Mamluks, or does it predate the conquest? So it, it, it predates that. So um, just to um, remind your listeners, um, when you said Mamluki Caliphate, they might not have seen the inverted commas because it's yes. the Abbasid Caliphate under the tutelage of the Mamluks. Of course, yes. We don't we don't want people jumping on us in that sense. But yes. Um, so the Ilmiya system actually intensifies during the period of Fatih. Okay, which is that the state becomes a very bureaucratic state. Um, and there is a need for, um, for so, so what the Ottomans are doing, let's roll it back to the beginning. All right, look. So in the period of Orma, o, Osman and Orhan Ghazi, the, the common narrative that is presented in Ottoman studies is one of the Ghazi thesis, the thesis of like the, the, whether the Ottomans were, were, were going to these wars for Islam or not, with certain Ottoman academics making the case that this was not about religion at all, um, this was more to do with expanding territory, uh, maintaining territory, taking booty and so forth, right? And other Ottoman historians making the case, and no, actually this was about, that Islam was a component of this, this was a part of their um, intentions and so forth. What's interesting in the Ghazi thesis is it's dependent on the, the, the warrior class and the ulama class are missing from this narrative. Right. Now, there are some works, um, I think Abdurrahman Achil's work, uh, in particular, is is a good book, and in, in um, not necessarily. I, I don't think this spilling the Ghazi, this sort of like um, this spelling the Ghazi thesis, but that's not what his intention is. What his intention is is to show the ulama as a bureaucratic class and how the evolution of the ulama takes place in this earlier period. But what one can take from his work, if they read it carefully, is that the ulama are part of the state building process very early on in terms of the Ottoman state um, in, in, in that sense. And so, you know, we see from Orhan Ghazi that mosques are being built and madrasas are being built. And this is important because a lot of some academics made the case whether the early Ottomans were even Muslim or not. Right. So the idea that mosques are being built, institutions of learning are being built, that the ulama have some level of influence on the early Ottoman leadership is an indication that they are there during this style of state building, which is different from, from what I would argue um, the Umayya or the Abbasids. I mean, clearly the Umayya have a different culture because of the transition from Khulafat al-Shadun in, into so forth. And you have 
Muawiya and then Marwan as well, who are f- family members of many Sahaba and so forth, and are there during the time of Rasulullah. So they, it's a different state for sure. But in the Ottoman context, it's, we can see that these states, these principalities, the ulama are part of some level of decision making or some sort of state building process, right? Now, by the time you conquer Istanbul, um, you are now an imperial state, and an imperial culture requires a new form of bureaucracy, a new form of of, of, of state building, a new form of um, administration. And it's here where the Ilmiya starts to become um, what you would say um, a significant institution of, of creating um, scholars whose jobs are, and I literally mean jobs, are to be judges, to be teachers, to be administrators, and to be in parts of the machinery across the various uh, areas of the Ottoman domains so that um, these various functions can take place. And it's in the farthest period that we see a huge jump and rise in the building of mosques and madrasas and complexes of this nature, especially in Istanbul and especially in the Balkan provinces where there's an absence of this. So this sort of state building becomes necessary. Now, whenever these mosques, madrasas and institutions and, and courts and so forth are being built at the same time, the ulama are part of that. Now, because there's no Arab provinces yet, this whole process is an Anatolian and Romeli process, which is Balkan process in that sense. And so this is how the Ilmiya structure it sort of starts to emerge. And then what happens in the, lack of, uh, the 16th century, which we're talking about, there becomes a clear distinction of job roles because knowledge becomes quite specific. So there's a distinction between the military class, the scribal class, and the Ilmiya, which is the religious class, where it becomes more important to have specific um, roles for people who are ulama who are going to do specific jobs like be like judges teachers and judges and so and forth yeah okay. right. and that has to there is a distinction created between them and say scribes who are dealing with the economics of the state hmm. or military men who whose, whose job is to organize the military ranks and so forth and so the ilmiya comes out of sort of a con- becomes consolidated as an institution as a result of that um, now once the arab provinces are, are, are conquered in that sense the Ilmiya doesn't extend into the Arab provinces. And the question is why? I mean, it could be one of the reasons is that machinery, that, that level of machinery has already been established. Extending it out into the Arab provinces would have been a humongous task. And usually these sort of like bureaucratic machineries happen more organically than forced. So that could be one reason. Another reason could be that the Arab provinces already had a particular culture of, of, of ulama. And it didn't require that. They had particular institutions which the Ottomans could just incorporate. And so they found ways of incorporating them. Um, so that's mainly what happens regarding the Ilmiya. Now, in the 18th, 19th century, something even more interesting happens, where the ulama are started to go into other spheres as a blurring of the lines take place. Well, let's return to the 18th, 19th century in, in a bit. But I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in, in this period. So we have... Sultan Fateh, who establishes this Ilmiya system, and it, it principally uh, expands to uh, the, uh, the the Balkans in the Anatolian region, and it, it's it's really there to systemize the judicial system. Now that you know the the Ottomans are an empire, and and they they look like an empire, right? Um, uh, and under Sultan Selim, when uh, there is a, a conquest and and a the defeat of the Mamluks, we now have you know, the, the Arab regions that are joined uh, to this empire, to this caliphate. Um, uh, why didn't they, because, because of course, in order to consolidate uh, these lands to the Ottomans, you need to have, surely you need to have centralized bureaucracies and centralized judiciaries, and you need to have, you know, connections between uh, between the various judicial systems that ex- that existed and, and exist, um, you know, in, in this newly formed expanded empire. Why? Okay, you, you've suggested that they've already got. Um, uh, I, I, so from that, I can imply that uh, the Ottomans just allowed the the Mamluk system of judiciary to continue and 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 didn't really didn't really uh, have have too much of a problem with? I, I would argue, um, firstly, I'm not sure if Fatih was the, if Fatih was the person who um, invented the Ilmiya. I think it was far more organic, but I think in Fatih's case, that it becomes far more prominent and pronounced. Um, 
but you, you're, you're correct in saying it, what it indicates, and this is what maybe I guess one of the points I want to make in this sense, because when I'm doing this, um, and what sometimes my students find it hard to grasp is um, legal pluralities, institutional pluralities, and plur pluralities within the ulama. That's part of our tradition. Uh -huh. And so when we talk about centralization in particular, there's an expectation that it should be all of the same. And what you see here is the Ottomans willing to negotiate with these forms of pluralities within their domains and are willing to negotiate and say, OK, this is a system that works. So one of the interesting things about the Ottomans, and we can say this is part of the Islamic tradition, they're not they're not institutional destroyers. They're institutional builders, actually. So they don't come into a place and just obliterate it. They actually come in and say, how can we build of this? Okay, what do you have already? So I give an example. You go to Cairo, how many Ottoman mosques you're going to see? Very few, if any, maybe just Mehmed Ali Pasha's mosque. And the reason being is because there were mosques there already. No need to come in and start to say, okay, tear the house down, we're going to turn this into an Ottoman city. And this you see across the domain. So the particular sophisticated infrastructures that the, the, the Arab ulama already had established under the Mamluks and in Baghdad and in the Hijaz and so forth. And the different types of uh, customs that the various provinces had within it, the Ottomans had no intention of trying to shake that in the earlier period, for sure. Now, I'm not going to talk about this now, but in the 18th, 19th century, when a, an attempt is being made for centralization, that's when the, the move is made. And it creates fissures, actually. It creates real agitation in that sense. So you can clearly see in the early Ottoman case that there is um, there is a, a, a sort of culture of be you know, be and let be to some degree, so long as some sort of um, um, allegiance has, is, has been made, that will suffice. The Ottomans do gradually, of course, um, uh, sort of like influence these areas where you start to see the emergence of the Hanifi Muftu in various cities. What's your Hanifi, Hanifi Muftu? So the, the Hanifi, the, 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 there will be a main Mufti in each um, each each uh, pro city or province, and he would be Hanifi, uh -huh. and his, uh, he, he, he would draw from Istanbul. And that actually became really important and a contested position in Cairo, in Baghdad, in, in, in Damascus, in Jerusalem and so forth, right? Um, and if you see, for example, like in Syria, I remember when I was in Syria, they had a 14-day um, visa law. After 14 days, you know, you had to go to the Hijr Jawazad, which was the, um, the uh, what do you call it? Migration. Migration, thank you very much. And, and you go there, and it's 14 days. So those 14 days were from the Hanafi law code. From Hanafi, after 14 days, you're not a traveler. It's really strange. Um, that might not be true, but that's what people were telling me in Syria, you know. And even in Egypt, that the role of the Hanifi Mufti was very prominent until the collapse of the Ottomans. And so the Ottomans had different styles of introducing um, their forms of influence um, within these the Arab provinces in particular. And in the Balkans, it was also done differently. Um, so that's, I think, what's happening. Um, Can you tell me what's the nature of the relationship between the Arab ulama and the Ottoman ulama uh, during this period of Salim? There was a fluidity already. Um, people, scholars, one of the things about the ulama is they're traveling scholars. They move around all the time. So um, that sort of interaction, I think, would have made it a lot smoother, actually, for transitions to take place. The ulama, in that sense, really help in the sense that they can go from one city to another and create particular imaginations. And the institutions are quite consistent across the board, whether it's the Mughal dynasty, the, um, the Ottoman dynasty or the Arab provinces. So people are familiar. So when we talk about the Muslim world as an idea, what, what actually holds the Muslim world together as an idea or an imagination are the ulama, because they create a particular consistency regarding fiqh, regarding law, regarding madrasas, regarding the, 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 the salah, this, all these systems are, continuously consistent so the, um, there would have been an interaction what changes however is that you start to see more and more works that are published in the Arab world now being sent to Istanbul this was something that Istanbul wanted and the freedom of movement would have been a lot more um, easier and a lot more flexible uh, in that sense and I would make the argument that it's not the Arab ulama and the Ottoman ulama it's the argument that the Arab ulama become the Ottoman ulama they, they become part of the Ottoman domains they are now part of the Ottoman, uh, il, um, not Ilmiya system, but they are part of the Ottoman ulama now. And you see this, for example, in the case of Rashid Redda, who considers himself to, or people consider himself to be one of the early Salafi thinkers. And he considers himself an Ottoman alim. He, he says it himself. So um, 
Now, what's interesting, one more point is in Istanbul, when you see the creation of Fatih Jami and Sulaymaniyah Jami, these are madrasa complexes. So these are not just mosques today when Muslim tourists come in and go, oh, wow, look how amazing and large the mosque is. You know, the Ottomans were wasting money building these large mosques. Actually, those two mosques in particular were university complexes like Oxford and Cambridge. And if you look outside, you can see that the madrasa complex is closed. So what, what the mosque was designed for is it was designed for Ulum ad and the study of Ulum ad And when students would study, for example, Salat al-Fajr, that mosque would have been filled of students who were in the dormitories and so forth, staying around the, the mosque complex. So that, that's absent from the imagination. And so what Fatih was doing, which was talking about Fatih and then Suleiman in particular, is they were trying to turn Istanbul into a major center of learning for Islam. So would you have seen Arab students and students from across the domains visiting uh, and studying at these, at these centers? It's a good question. I really don't know is the honest answer to your question. I'm sure people were coming and traveling and coming over. Um, What we do see is that um, the Ilmiya structure by the 16th century um, had created an environment of um, um, promoting the learning of Islam in cities, in urban cities. And to a certain degree, um, people would get um, high positions depending on the types of areas they went and studied. And then over years, it became family networks and family structures and so forth. And so going to Fatih and going to Sulaymaniyah and coming to Istanbul as a way of learning Islam and encouraging that would have, one, um, given the individual some level of credibility that they were a graduate from one of these institutions. And so they could find work in the hierarchy quite easily. And secondly, it would have it would have facilitated the um, the sort of like is, gradual Islamization of, of, of the city of Istanbul, in which and and this happens via the ulama class. Explain the ilmiya structure, like what it, who's at the head and, and how does it work and function. So the ilmiya structure is is basically you have so the Ottomans are also constructed as Sheikh Islam, right? So they, they this is a new phenomenon when we're talking about. It, Ibn Taymiyyah or Al-Ghazali has been Sheikh al-Islam. These are honorary titles just given to them. But in the Ottoman context, this is a position that's held, which is the, the chief mufti of the Ottoman state would have been, basically the, the job of the Sheikh al-Islam is to advise the Sultan on various matters. What's interesting is the job of the Sheikh al-Islam. It's interesting. He could also remove the Sultan in that sense. So it was an institution which um, had emerged within the Ottoman context, but it had some level of independence. And then the system is broken down into you having the chief mufti of um, Rumeli, which is, you know, Rumelia, and then the chief mufti of Anadolu, which is uh, Anatolia. So then it breaks down into a hierarchy. And then various sub hierarchies break down from that and so forth. And then, and, and that was across the Balkans and Anatolia in that sense. And it was, and in, under their jurisdiction would have been. The, the Sharia courts, um, waqfs in, in that sense, and the madrasa systems, and that would have been regulated by then, by them. But to assume that the the central state wasn't overseeing what they were doing would be a mistake. Um, and this is the, the the complexity, which is on the one hand, there is a clear demarcation taking place between these various institutional bodies, but at the same time, there is a lot of blurring. That, that is hard to explain if we're going to use a language which is quite um, Christian-centered in comparison. What I mean by that is because often references are made to, to experiences in Western Europe, which are of a particular disposition which come from the Christian culture um, in terms of priesthoods and, and, and so forth. And because the language in, in that sense tries to create a clear demarcation between church and state, then there is an assumption that there is a separation of roles. Whereas in the, in the Ottoman period, you can see that while we may use this type of language as, a, as comparison, but there's still a lot of blurring. There's a lot of bleeding into areas which are difficult to, to explain to students sometimes because they become accustomed to internalizing these clear demarcations. Um, there are demarcations, but at the same time, like I said, there aren't in that sense. No, that's a very good point. So the Sheikh al-Islam's responsibility is to manage this Ilmiya system, uh, but also to advise the caliph and, and uh, in extremists to, to remove the caliph if, if the caliph doesn't. What are the conditions of 
that the Sheikh al-Islam would have in his mind uh, if if it ever came to the point of removing the caliph. And how, was the caliph ever removed by the Sheikh al-Islam? Yeah, there was loads of cal- the caliphs that were removed by the Sheikh al-Islam. Yeah. Well, this is why, so let me give you an example of the blur in the light. The, it's, the, it's the Khalifa who chooses the Sheikh al-Islam, right? So on the one hand, he makes the choice of having the Sheikh al-Islam. And on the other hand, it's this Sheikh al-Islam who can remove him. So we see this in case of Salim III, okay, before Mahmoud II, where he chooses the caliph. And he, there's this anecdote in the works of Salim Argun, who talks about um, how... Uh, the caliph says, I, I, gifted, I gifted the Sheikh al-Islam this pen that I made for him. And he used it to sign the document of the fatwa to remove me from power. So you can see in this context. Um, but there was many. So Gen Chosman was probably uh, the first. And, and why was he removed? So his case is quite complicated. The, I, the simple narrative is that they say he wanted to go on the Hajj. But in actuality, more and more Ottoman historians are saying he wanted to make the case or the... Um, of, of um, uh, reforming the military and the janissary in particular. And so there was a contestation um, due to that. Um, what we see in, in this case though, is um, a movement in this period of um, uh, what Baki Tesjan calls, um, he calls it the jurist law. So the ulama are trying to create a system which is moving away with particular forms of custom and is trying to create a, a system based on jurist law, which gives them more agency in the political decision-making process. And one of the points I want to make here, I guess, is that this has been throughout Ottoman history, a continual contestation between the ulama's tradition of jurist law and the Ottoman sultan's prerogative as the sultan and what sort of authority and law he can also enact in that sense. And so there's a continued contestation in this sense and a backwards and forward that takes place. Um, and the Hal Fatwa, which is called, or Hal Fatwa, is a fatwa which the Alim, the Sheikh al-Islam writes to remove a Sultan. This is an Ottoman concept, by the way. You, you could say a state fatwa to remove the leader of the state. We don't see this type of culture in, in, in this way, by Muslims before that. So this is very unique that you have to get a fatwa. And I mean, it's a legal opinion. So generally fatwas are not necessarily binding, but the Hal fatwa was binding. Um, it was a fatwa that once the Sheikh al-Islam signed it, that was it. And we see this in the case of Abdul Hamid II when they come to get the fatwa from the Sheikh al-Islam and he doesn't want to sign it. Yes. And then the rhetorical yeah. device is used against him. To, to force him into signing it because he, he couldn't escape the question in the way that the question is, is put forward. This is interesting about fatwa culture then because it indicates that it's fatwas, sometimes people ask the question, why did the Sheikh Islam give this fatwa or that fatwa? Well, anyone who's studied Ulum Bedin knows that the way the question is constructed, that's the way the, the alim answers it. And so the way that particular times people will construct questions, that the scholars became clever in the way of how to construct the question, because the answer would often just be yes or no. It wouldn't be a detailed explanation in that sense. So the Hal Fatwa was one. The Janissary was another one. The Janissary court, for various reasons, um, were perceived by some Ottoman historians as being a, um, a, a, a sort of like um, the voice and ears of, of, of um, society in the Ottoman domains. And they would use the physical force to, to remove the Sultan when he refused to, to step down. And so we see on many occasions, the Janissary along with the ulama work together to remove a particular Sultan. This is why the argument has then been made that when Mahmoud II removes the Janissaries, that the ulama lose a sense of um, a physical force that, that can hold the, um, the, the caliph to account. But this is why then we move into constitutional discourse because there's no longer a physical force that can do it, then they start to work towards documentation. So there are various mechanisms that they used um, to remove sultans from power. And, and what kept these institutions independent? Why couldn't the, uh, the caliph just um, use his, his power and his authority to, uh, to, to undermine these institutions and create you know, a, a, a strong authoritarian center? Well, we do see attempts of that from time to time. And I, I guess this is what people don't understand about um, Muslim political discourse. And this is where the Ottomans are, for me anyway, quite interesting. Because when you look at the contest- contestation of power and the balance of power, there's a continued 
um, push and pull within the various institutions to try to maintain power. Um, so on the one hand, they're all aware of the structure, that this is the main uber structure that we all belong to, the House of Osman. And um, the, the House of Osman is the main pillar of, of uh, the Ottoman state. The Ilmiya is uh, under the jurisdiction of the ulama. Um, you could argue that um, the Janissaries are a particular influence um, regarding the military. And yet, whenever each one of these institutions has an intention of extending their sphere of influence, it, it imposes on the other institution to some degree, right? And sometimes these um, uh, impositions were amicably addressed and sometimes they led to violence. And so one of the things that I, I make the argument for is like when you see revolt, protest and revolution, these are extreme forms of negotiation because what you see is a revolt or revolution may take place, but the, the house doesn't come down the leader is removed, right? Unlike when we see revolutions in today's day and age, we expect an absolute change of, of, of the structure. But here that doesn't happen. So we see that these are tools that are used in the extreme forms for um, negotiation. And this is like, we're willing to go this far because we want that person at the top gone. So sometimes caliphs knew that this Sheikh al-Islam is problematic for me. Let me get him out of it. Sometimes the Sheikh al-Islam as an alim had, you know, a lot of, popularity amongst the masses. He couldn't remove him. And he had charisma, people knew. Sometimes the Sheikh al-Islam might have been a stooge of, of the Caliph. But the point here is, is moving away from the individual and looking at the, um, the paradigm of the ulama. I always make this case when someone asked me once in England, you know, if the ulama, you know, couldn't they just like manipulate the Sharia? Well, no, because the, 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 the infrastructure of belonging to the, the institution or the meta institution of being the ulama, and if one alim did such and such, another alim would hold him to account. So it's not only that the ulama are holding the state to account or, the, or holding the leadership to account or holding society to account, they have mechanisms amongst themselves where they're holding each other to account. And so they can't escape that paradigm that's already been created for them, which is based on being sincere to the deen of itself. I mean, one could argue that even in the Shahada, when you see the Shahada, Rasul Salam, you say, Abduhu wa Rasul, that the idea of being Abduhu, that even Rasul Salam is bound to the um, sort of like the jurisdiction of Allah Ta'ala in this sense, right? And this culture then manifests in the ulama. So if, if an alim of a particular disposition was, you know, um, aligning himself with the Sultan, other ulama would talk out. Uh, and, and you couldn't control it because the ulama are not restricted just to the Ottoman domains. There are ulama in India, there are ulama in Malaysia, there are ulama in China, in Africa. Everyone can have a say here. So sometimes when it's interesting, you see things happening in Istanbul, you see works in Egypt being written and so forth. So this is where the, the job of the academic scholar is, is how do, we, how do we find these complaints out? So when we talk about, for example, I don't know, why did the Ottomans agree with fratricide? And it's always, why did they agree with the fratricide? But, okay, were the ulama complaining about this? Were the ulama who said this is unacceptable? Were they negotiating debates? Yeah, yeah, they were. Not everyone accepted it outright. And the thing is, is the fratricide wasn't like a, a policy. This is what people think. They think this was just a policy in place that every sultan was doing. It wasn't. It's just that a particular precedent was set once. And once it was set, the, the others would draw back into the repository of the past and suggest that their reality is similar to that reality and they want to execute this. And so they would find excuses to justify why they need to do this act. And they would find a way of circumventing the particular tradition. But there were many occasions where they were not given the permission to do so. Can you give me an example where that happened? i give an example. During the Young Turk Revolution, um, Sultan Abdul Hamid II petitioned the Sheikh al-Islam to crush the rebellion in the Balkans. And the Sheikh al-Islam said no. He said, because this has a civilian component to it. If it was a, because the argument initially was this was a, a military rebellion, this is buggy, this is the act of um, revolt, and so send the army to crush it. But once a petition came through and it had a civilian component, they said, no, you can't do that. Which is important because this is different than what happened in Egypt in, in the modern period with the Muslim Brotherhood. The Abdul Hamid was bound by the authority of the Sheikh al-Islam. That institution did its function. In, even though it's complicated, and he couldn't move. And that institution, in that sense, is then necessary um, to have a, a particular standing in the eyes of people that can have an emotional impact 
on the Sultan himself. So this is why I make the argument that the Ottoman state is an emotional state in the sense that religion is not just about intellect, it's also about emotion. And um, the Ottoman state had to be empathetic towards the needs of its subjects and citizens. And that the ulama were a voice of those subjects and citizens. And if the Ottoman state went beyond its jurisdiction and implemented forms of violence, then the language of Islam was sufficient that they had to fear Allah would be sufficient to put them back into check. Now, sometimes that, of course, individuals, they push the boundaries and so forth. But that was in the culture of the Ottoman domains, which the ulama had, had sort of like continuously um, implemented. And that's important to understand that, which is something missing in the modern nation state. You, you paint a very vivid picture of the ulama being representatives of the people and the caliphs have to be uh, have to be mindful of 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 those people and and so in a sense the the ulama the independence and the position of the ulama uh you know is is so important because uh the and 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 so and and those the boundaries between the ulama and and the caliph um and the independence between these two are maintained because you know, the caliph fears the people. It's not only that the caliph fears the people, you would, the, the culture would have been that you would argue that it's, it's fair to argue that they were God fearing. They were fearing Allah as well. You know what I mean? You know what's interesting as well about the ulama? And, and I find this, and people don't realize this. Imagine your qadi in the judge, your judge, and a woman comes up to you and she goes, I want to divorce my husband. Well, what's, what happened? And then she explains her case. He's interacting with human beings on a human level. He's listening to the complaints of people on a human level, from divorce proceedings to state proceedings. In that sense, not only are they attached to uh, the, the sources of Islam, they're also attached generally to society, which sometimes the Sultan is not, he's distant. But there's a continue, and because they have a hierarchy and structure, they're talking to each other, they're going to the coffee houses, they, the, the, the word of mouth is filtering through. There is a particular, um, culture of empathy within the institution, which is hard to document by historians, but I'm aware of this because when you mix with ulama, you, you see it with your own eyes, which gives them an edge to be representatives of society and society would turn to them and say, this is not right. There's a sense of injustice being done towards me. Why are you not saying something? So even if we look at the, the, the Syrian revolution, for example, uh, that took place, they would turn into the ulama and say, say something. Now, the question is, is it fair for them to ask the ulama to do that, who are equally human beings and are equally can be subject to violence and death and, and torture? But nonetheless, this is the expectation because they have some sort of mediatory role. The difference between the Syrian state, the Ba'athist regime, was that it had no fear of, of, of the Islamic component. So the agency of the ulama was a lot weaker in that context. The only agency the ulama had was that it was representative of the society. But in the Ottoman case, it's not only that they represent the society, they're representatives of the deen as well, which the Ottomans took seriously on many occasions. Maybe there was a given sultan here and there who maybe didn't care. But by and large, what I'm talking about on a meta level, and this is why I keep using that case, that um, their existence matters. This is why the Turkish Republic was very smart in removing their existence. I think that was a fascinating discussion. Inshallah, next week we look at the ulama in the later period and some of the controversies such as the printing press and the banning of coffee as well as the removal of Sultan Abdul Hamid by the ulama uh, in uh, the early 20th century.